All right, so I'm presenting the uh, second chapter for the special statistics for the science book. And in this chapter, we're going to just briefly touch upon the main R packages to the spatial data in R. But before we go into the details of the packages, so for representation of spatial data, there are two common types. So first, is factor data and second is raster data. So for factor data, it is um, it contains points, lines, polygons, and an example in the book is like road or rail networks. And also factor data can be used to represent boundaries of a certain region. For example, the um, parameters of a province, district, and so on. And raster data, on the other hand, it represents um, a spatially continuous phenomena, such as elevation, but it is represented in the grids, in grids of equal sizes. And we'll see an example later on. So for factor data, um, I understand that the main R package that is used is SF, and this package um, I think supersedes the SP package, and this package um, reads a data storage format called shapefile, which is actually not really a file, but um, a directory containing um, at least three files, and so within each same file, we have um, all of these uh, files. So these are the extension of the files within each shape file folder. And each of the files has a specific um, function, let's say. So the .shp contains the geometry data. And here we can see so on the right hand side, we can see an example of factor data. So here are the polygons, the lines, and the points. I hope you see my cursor. And, and then the second type of file is the .shx, which contains the positional index of the geometry data. And finally, the .dbf is the attributes for each of the shapes contained in the, the .shp file. And so these are the three mandatory files, but it can also contain another files. For example, uh, .prj, it is a plain text describing a projection. And what do I mean exactly by projection? We will discuss this also in this chapter when we are talking about the, um, for example, the coordinate reference system. And so this shape file can be read using the st underscore read function from the SF package. So if we, so if we, uh, if we go into the example file provided in the packet, in the SF package, we can see that the shape file contains these four files. So we can see the .shp, .shx, and the .dpf, which is the, so these are the three um, compulsory files, and then the .trj, which indicates what sort of projection the shapes are represented in, if I understand Can correctly. I add something? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I found it a bit um, surprising uh, that in the book uh, it's it only talks about the shape file because um, currently um, in uh, other resources they much recommend newer file formats like the geo, like the geo package for example. So, but. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably know it, the geo package, but no, but it's a, 
Right. That's actually it's a SQLite database, but it's just oh. a single file. It's just a single file, so it has the extension GPKG uh, from Geo Package, um, and um, there's also GeoJSON, and those two are um, open standards. Actually, this one is a uh, an file format from Esri, which has been reverse engineered, um, hmm. so it's uh, not really the best path to go for for um uh, let's say open science um but it has been around for a long time so there are really a lot of data sets which are shape files but they have their limitations as well because mm -hmm. um yeah they cannot store multiple layers a geo package can store multiple layers uh, next to each other um yeah. one layer in a geo package can contain multiple types of geometries even does mm. not shape file it is just always all polygons or all, all lines or all points etc and also the 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 column names they are limited in in uh, length i think it's at maximum a maximum of 10 so if you uh, make ah. an r so for example if you make a spatial r object and you write it to a file um, better not use a shape file because yeah it will be converted or uh, it will be shortened etc so it, it it works nevertheless but it is uh, a bit less convenient also because uh, you need indeed multiple files to if you want to pass along uh, to someone else uh, the data oh. set okay. now anyway it, it's, it is uh, still as useful as before the shape file so we should not uh, say it is not not good to use it but i think there are more modern alternatives at the moment all right and so when you say that the shapefile was reverse engineered so you mean that that is a closed source system and they try to replicate it somehow using this a shapefile you mean? Uh, is that what you yeah mean? that's what i think i have uh, once read about ah. so i'm not uh, do not know details about that but at least um the there are there is actually a backend that sf uses it's the gdal library it's the geospatial mm -hmm. data abstraction library which is used by a lot of geospatial software like um, qgis for example and, and other software they also use it as a backend and yeah. it is gdal that does the the work actually so to read and write data sets. so sf just links to gdal and it is the drivers that gdal contains so for different file formats that do the actual work so it is in gdal that there is a shape file an esri shape file uh, driver which they have um created up to a point that it does everything as you would as you can do um from within an esri um system for example yes all right that's interesting. So, and so here the data set is used from from within the SF uh, package, so within the um, installed package directory. But uh, if you would go and look there, you would find other data sets to play with as well. Uh, and one at least, at least one geo package as well. All right. It doesn't matter for the the spirit, of course, for, of the chapters. It's, I think it's uh, worth knowing that. That's all. Yeah, but I mean, uh, I can imagine that what you said about the geo package would be much more convenient because, for, uh, well, because here an example was uh, that was given was about root network. Then I can imagine if we want to um, represent a traffic in a certain region, it's not only roads, right? It can be also train tracks and so on. Mm -hmm. And if you need multiple shape files for the same region, then I, I can understand it can get uh, a bit complex quickly. Uh, so yeah, I can understand it, Bill. And yes. when I, I also explored the uh, well, this object, it seems uh, like this is mostly data frame with nice properties. Uh, well, with the spatial properties uh, from the SF. Um, so I was not entirely sure, like, okay yeah um, yeah for the example that you give with the uh, roads and uh, and uh, polygons and so you, it would typically be several distinct layers inside a geo package which you can then distribute as one file yeah mm -hmm. all right well 
it's only uh, that 40 uh, shape file and uh, 40 factor data. And then we'll go next on the um, raster data, which is also referred as quick data. And in contrast to uh, factor data or shape file, where we have information about the polygons, lines, or points, in raster data, it divides region of study into same size rectangles or grids that is called cells or pixels. So this is an example from the book. And within each um, grid, it can store one or more values um, yeah, for the grid. And one of the, well, the main R package to work with raster data is called Terra. And the files for this raster data often come in GeoTIFF format. So, um, so this is just an example. And I think what I learned the most in this chapter is about the uh, coordinate reference systems. I think this is uh, very important to uh, get it right uh, to understand. So, coordinate reference systems specifies origin and unit of measurements of spatial coordinates. And uh, well, I learned that there are a lot of coordinate reference systems all around the world. And by having this um, coordinate reference system uh, all bunched together, it can allow transformation of multiple data to a common coordinate reference system. So. Uh, for example, a file, even though it is um, safe in, uh, with a certain coordinate reference system, but to my understanding, it seems uh, possible or seamless to convert from one system to another. So there are two types of the coordinate reference system, the unprojected or geographic CRS and projected CRS. So for the unprojected or geographic CRS, it uses latitude and longitude to represent locations on Earth's 3D ellipsoid surface. So just imagine a globe and uh, you can think of the imaginary horizontal and vertical lines to, uh, that we can use to refer to a location and then a projected CRS, which uses Cartesian coordinates to reference location on two-dimensional representation. And this might not seem um, obvious. Well, for me, it does not seem obvious at all. Um, what is actually the important implication between having 3D and 2D representation for, for the unprojected and projected, but We'll um, go about it later. So for the geographic um, CRS or the unprojected CRS, um, again, it uses latitude and longitude to identify locations on Earth 3D surface. So for um, latitude, um, it angles north or south of the equator and it ranges from minus 90 in the south pole to 90 degrees in the north pole and then for longitude it angles from west to east of the prime meridian which range from negative 180 degrees running west to 180 degrees running east and the unit of distance can be expressed in degrees, minutes, seconds, or in decimal degrees. And what I find the most important is that this geographic CRS, um, so for the degrees, for the latitude, um, the unit is the same everywhere. So one degree of latitude um, equals approximately 111 kilometers. And the same applies to the longitude, but only at the equator. So if we, um, so, so. 
So the more we go to the, um, so as you can see here in the um, longitude, it can, uh, like the line sort of shrinks, uh, so, so the distance between the lines sort of shrinks as we go toward the poles. And therefore, whenever we go to the, toward either of the poles, the actual length of longitude, and by actual, I mean when we are converting degrees of longitude to kilometers, so it is the widest at the equator and then shrinks as we move toward the poles. Actually, um, the geographic CRSs, they also define the ellipsoid. It's not explicit, I think, in the book, but they also define the ellipsoid. You have multiple ellipsoidal models of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's already may um, make some differences and, uh, also the 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 fact that um, the distance between two values of a latitude is the same is actually for a globe not not for the ellipsoidal model because there it would so this is approximately right of mm -hmm. course I think it's in the book that it is approximate but um, Actually, though, so the software it, it uses ellipsoidal formulation, so they are more complex uh, than with uh, global. Um, hmm. so, yeah. Well, how little I know about the earth that we live in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and yeah, so for and then after the geographic or unprojected CRS. We also have the projected CRS, which now we have the 2D representation. And um, well, if I understand correctly, this 2D representation is more useful for navigation, it seems, or not entirely sure. But um, I guess the most important uh, point that we have to understand is that there is no perfect projections. Every projection has their own trade-off, depending on what one thinks is the most important, because all projections produce the distortion of the Earth's surface. So I think Mercator projection is one of the most commonly used. And then um, here we can see like um, Greenland is very big, and Russia is also uh, represented as a huge country, which is not necessarily uh, true, but then because of how it is located very near to the pole and in micro projection, it sort of stretch areas near the pole and therefore the areas for the countries near this region, near the edges of the uh, zones becomes very much enlarged. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And I mean, also, I guess, you know, I can really see that the, the global South countries seems to be very small compared to those in the North um, for whatever reason when uh, this market person made this uh, projection. Um, and yeah. yeah. The, uh, just just wanted to add something because you noted the difference between 3D, 2D um actually the two the i think the main reason for using projections so 2d represent representations it's because for the display of maps ah, um, like on screens you mean on screens on devices on paper for for centuries already um whether you measure distances in the 2d or or on the 3d it's another matter but but it's uh, much simpler to do it in 2d because you have sim more simple mathematical uh, formula to do that but it um, can have distortions and mostly will have distortions compared to doing that in a 3d coordinate reference system which we cannot uh, display as 3d 
uh, in in a screen. So even the the images shown of the globe uh, in the three D part, yeah, it's another type of projection. It's it's mm. make impression of how it looks like uh, the Earth from from a distance at three D, but it's still a projection into the. It it's also has distortions. Everything becomes very narrow at the borders because they are at the sides. So it's also a 2D projection, which is displayed to get this idea of uh, of the Earth. But the real 3D, it, it needs three dimensions. You cannot uh, show it, um, yeah. really show sure. it. And yeah, so I, so I think the book only really briefly touched upon this universal transverse megatop projection. But I mean, I clicked the link. And it seems to be very important. Uh, well, I don't know, but yeah. So the idea of this universal transverse Mercator projection, I think it is uh, a very handy to use if we want to travel from north to south, but not necessarily from east to west. Because here, so in this um, universal transverse Mercator projection. So you can imagine um, that Earth, the globe, is sort of a squeeze into the cylinder, and then we can cut the cylinder into 60 equal sizes, and what is called 60 multidose zones, that is numbered consecutively from west to east. So I think here there is also a significant amount of distortion, especially in the um, edges of the zones, uh, but if I understand correctly, this, this type of projection really better preserve the shapes and angles, and because here the distance is in metric units, and coordinates are always positive, so ca to calculate distance between two points seems to be much more simple. Uh, but then again, yeah, so there is also the extreme distortion near the zone edges. And I guess the most important point uh, for this universal transverse method of projection is that it trades global accuracy for better local properties. Maybe I can also add something for the UTM. Sure. Um, I, I did uh, look into it some time ago. Uh, actually, the distortion in the case of UTM, it is not extreme, uh, so to say. Well, um, because uh, it works with the zones. If it would just um, use this single cylinder, as you show, as this single uh, way of um, developing the Earth's surface onto the cylinder mm -hmm. uh, and do that for the whole Earth, then we would have large distortions. But by doing it only for a width of six degrees longitude and then shifting each time you, you keep close, ah. to, you keep close to that great circle. And there in that narrow zone, the distortion is limited. So it is always less than 1%, I, I believe, uh, near the, the, the edges. So uh, it's something like that. And so, and that's why you, you get those 60 zones to, to cover the whole of the earth, uh, actually. Ah, so you yes. mean like this, the zones can be like a sliding window depending on where you, the center, where you are? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And actually, the, the 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 image that you have you show here that it illustrates the sixty zones of UTM, mm -hmm. but it is not the UTM projection, because each zone actually um, contain the zones have overlaps. In, ah. in reality, because the longitudes, the, the meridians, they come together in the poles. Yes, yes. So, and if you, but they do use ah. um, a constant width for each zone, and then shift yeah. so that you have overlaps. Um, some somehow, they they do. Um, yeah, you they they do um, cut it with the meridians, 
so it gets actually narrower. So mm -hmm. you, what you actually have is something that narrows towards um, the poles. Yes, something this uh, this way. So it's it's less distorted than you have here. It's probably a Mercator projection, uh, yeah. which really extends it and shows it as a, a parallel lines, which it is not in practice. The longitudes do, are not parallel in the in the UTM projection. Oh. All right. Yeah, I was also a bit uh, confused uh, when I saw this lab because it is exactly the same like here, the market projection, but then it's sliced into 60, like okay, what are difference? But I do get the idea given here in the cylinder. But I, thank you for pointing that out. Um, yeah, so um, for all of the coordinate systems, um, instead of um, remembering all the names and maybe in the process uh, people can misunderstand each other and they're communicating about the projections apparently there is this um, european petroleum survey group codes which basically serve as unique numeric identifiers of all of the coordinate reference systems and um, the coordinates um, system can be represented in four to five digit numbers between 1024 and 2767, which um, I'm not entirely sure, like is all of the numbers in this range used to represent the coordinates or it's just people can pick one of uh, the nice numbers within the range. Really not sure about this because if it is the case then there are well so many coordinate reference systems but yeah. Yeah. i don't think they are all in use uh, ah, all right i think they make jumps but there are thousands of them Oof. but i don't think it is a uh, thirty thousand. <laughs> i don't believe <laughs> so but there are thousands and uh as i think and um also, uh, some get replaced by newer, etc. So some some are deprecated, but uh, stored yet because of historical uh, usage. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, but I mean, um, the idea of having hundreds, thousands of coordinate systems is is just crazy to me. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, but even just the UTM, it's already Com a, that is a composed uh, map projection. Um, yeah. it, it is a composition of 120 CRSs because you have the 60 zones. Ah. And so you already need two CRSs for the two zones because the northern hemisphere has its origin mm. on the equator and the southern hemisphere has its origin in the, in the south just to avoid negative coordinates there. So, um, uh -huh. yes, so it's, it's just like that. And so you, you have two two projections for one band or zone. And then, uh, so that's it's 60 times two. So it's 120. And um, apart from that, so it's a projection. And a projection always starts from a geographical series. Um, which has to be defined. It's it's ellipsoid and also the, the geodetic datum, which defines how that ellipsoid is attached to the real earth so mm -hmm. that you can, in fact, connect uh, the abstract geometry and, and coordinates on an ellipsoid uh, to a real place which we can visit. It's not something that emerges from itself. It has to be, it's em it emerges from a definition of which um, geodetic datum is being used, which defines the positioning of that ellipsoid. Uh, and mostly it is only uh, well fit for a certain region, even for geographical coordinate references, and they can be fit to, to well match a particular region. So you have multiple, mm -hmm. multiple ellipsoids, multiple geographic datums, which means uh, a whole lot of multiple 
different geographic reference coordinate reference systems just to represent latitude longitude so there's not just one solution there so and then you can multiply that by um, a number of all different kinds of geometrical projections so there are 120 utm projections for this geodetic datum for example wgs84 but there are also 120 for um etrs89 which is related but still different and and which is actually one that is fixed to the european plate while the wgs84 mm -hmm. is not fixed to to um, continental plates but just a global coordinate reference system um useful for satellites and etc and so that already um explains in part why there are so many and and then for the projections themselves they can be chosen in various ways for their different properties and distortions and so often they are country specific sometimes a country has multiple ones or regional oh. ones so there that is often the explanation though it's it has its historical reasons often for more than 100 years in in all kind of countries and so it is a huge has been a huge effort to collect that in a systematic way in one global database because it is a yeah, it was sometimes just on paper and you know, there, there are numerous resources to read about that uh, historical oh. aspect it's it's very interesting to see how it can go but i'm not I'm just studying that from a, from a distance. It's not that I <laughs> can really tell about examples and stuff, but um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, honestly, before I read this chapter, um, well, my naive and ignorant mind really thinks that map globes should be, I don't know, uh, we should, uh, with all of the GPS and satellite information, shouldn't we have like uh, a completion a certain state of completion or perfection in our knowledge but i mean i can be well, i cannot be more wrong uh apparently it is way way more much more complex than that and i just find it very interesting how i mean uh from hundreds of years ago when people are voyaging uh, to look for spices for example they have nothing uh, to guide them except for the stars and then we have the satellites, but still, uh, we're still having a hard time in yes. finding these projections. Yes. Just find um, it very fascinating. Yeah. And there will never be one single geodetic datum that can be used everywhere in the most optimal way, simply because the ellipsoidal model of the Earth's surface is only an approximation. It, it, even when you disregard mountains and just look at uh, gravitational, mm -hmm. yeah, at the, the surface with equal gravitational, uh, ah. it, is called the, it is called the geoid, and it is not a perfect ellipsoid. It, it's, so this really means you cannot easily make a, a model of, of the real uh, surface. And uh, so it's always an approximation. And then you have to yeah, choose one that is mm. good for a particular region. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, well, um, I guess what is nice about all of this um, unique numeric identifiers is that with either SF terra packages, we can conveniently obtain what coordinate reference system is actually used within the files that we have, because supposedly the coordinate reference system should be embedded in each of the files. And once we identify or get the CRS within the file, we can uh, convert it to the coordinate system of our liking. So, um, oh yeah, there is this um, one additional subsection on both our packages, but I, I didn't uh, go into that. But yeah, that is 
all for uh, the material today. Thank you so much for the inputs. I really, really find this in interesting about the maps and coordinates. Yeah, no problem. I'm just looking up um, in another book. There is a very nice book about geocomputation with R. That is the title. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. think more deeply explains. Uh, well, um, I'll put a, a link in the chat. Um, what coordinate reference systems are um, put right. it in the chat. And I think there is also another book which may perhaps even go further if you would like to get your feet wet. Um, ah, yeah, it does go into more detail here. Yes. In this book. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm just from another book. Uh, it's a spatial data science, um, which also has a comparable um, paragraph, uh, but probably with some uh, with its own uh, mm -hmm. aspects as well. So I've put the link as well as in here. I think both of those books uh, have also been in the R for data science uh, book clubs, but I okay. uh, yeah I could not join them. Uh, what's the other book? Special data science. Yes, I've put the link in the chat. Ah, all right. So it's a uh, yeah, it's the link to the specific paragraph on coordinate reference systems. But uh, of course, it is in the book, so um, you get the book then. Ah, all right. Oh yeah, that's great. The more detail on all of these yes. coordinates. So... Yes, I, oh. I think this is also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, written by geographers, or at least by, it is written the book by um, yeah, Roger, Roger Bivand and Ezra Pabesma. So those are the two authors of um, SF, SP, uh, and, and many other uh, spatial packages. Hmm. Nice. But I think... Uh, despite the fact that we read this book, uh, it, it's good to mention that uh, for spatial data science, these are really useful books. Um, but um, I was really keen for this book because it, um, I mean, uh, the book that we have the book lab on, because it dives really more deeply into spatial statistics. Yeah. Yeah, I also uh, came to the club uh, really not because of all the coordinates and so on. I'm interested to apply all these uh, images that I mean, and then I find that all of this coordinate stuff is just so fascinating. Very, very yes, interesting. It's really a fascinating. Um, how much we, yeah, how much we are still far from perfection. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. So um, I guess that's it.